they look like any other people of the Indian subcontinent. Speak an Indo-Aryan language. Share the same festivals, the same rhythms of life. But beneath the surface, deep inside their blood, something doesn't fit. A whisper from the East. A signal no one expected. Because when scientists cracked the Bengali genome, they found a piece of the puzzle that shouldn't exist. 9 to 15 percent of their DNA traced. Not to Delhi, not to the Gangetic Plains, but to lands far beyond the Himalayas. To the forests of Burma, to the shadow of Tibet. It makes no sense. History books tell a different story. They speak of Indo-Aryan migrations from the West, of empires and dynasties, of Bengal as the beating heart of South Asia. Not once do they mention an eastern tide flowing silently into this land. And yet it's there, etched into every chromosome like a secret map, a map that pulls us across borders, across centuries, asking one question that shakes the ground beneath our feet how did this imprint sneak into a people so rooted in South Asia? Was it an invasion we forgot? A hidden kingdom wiped from memory? Or something stranger, something softer in exchange that didn't leave ruins, only bloodlines? Because the truth is, this isn't just a statistical anomaly. It's a doorway. And when you step through it, the entire history of Bengal begins to shift. What we thought, we knew, crumbles. What we ignored starts to matter. Because this genetic whisper doesn't point to a single event, it points to a world in motion. And the trail begins in an age of collapse. When empires burned and the rivers of Bengal opened their arms to forces no one saw coming, the answer is hidden in a forgotten breakdown of power and a trade route that rewrote destiny. When an empire falls, history calls it an ending. But sometimes, collapse opens a door. Sixth century Bengal. The mighty Gupta Empire. Gone. Its walls crumbling into dust, its roads splitting like dry earth. Trade routes, once guarded by soldiers, now lay bare under the monsoon sky. Chaos. Yes, but also an invitation. A silent signal to those waiting beyond the hills. And they came. Not as conquerors. Not with fire and swords. They came with silk glimmering like water in the Sunday, with salt carved from distant shores, with words that sounded like music no Bengali had heard before. They came along the rivers those endless veins of Bengal slipping through the mangrove shadows where no fortress could hold them back. And as they came, they carried something no caravan ever recorded, something that would outlast every coin, every kingdom, every page of history. Their blood. Scientists call it an admixture, a merging of worlds written into flesh, and they can trace it the moment it happened. Fifteen centuries ago, when Bengal's gates opened and East Asia stepped through, tibeto burman traders from the northern hills, Austroasiatic-speaking peoples drifting from the far east, not armies, but families, not destroyers, but builders of a story that Bengal still carries in its veins. And yet, this was no quiet footnote. This was a turning point so deep it would split identities, blur borders, and make a people who look one way but whisper another truth inside every cell. But if these newcomers weren't invaders, then what were they? What did they seek in this delta of endless rivers? And why, of all places, did they choose Bengal to leave their legacy? Because this wasn't just trade. It was something more intimate. Something that crossed beyond goods and gold, and into the most human exchange of all. The kind that binds not by treaties, but by blood. And it begins with a question that no chronicle dares to ask. Who were the women who carried the East into Bengal's heart? They came quietly. Not as kings. Not as armies. But as women walking barefoot along riverbanks, their faces veiled by the shadow of bamboo groves. Imagine the journey. From the hills of Burma, from the valleys of the Salween River crossing forests where the air hums with cicadas, slipping into boats carved from single logs, drifting down black waters that would one day meet the Ganges. They carried no banners, no weapons, no empire to proclaim. Only baskets of rice, silk bundles, and something far more enduring than trade goods. Their blood. 
because when scientists drilled into the very core of Bengali DNA, they found a pattern no chronicle recorded maternal lineages rooted not in India but in Southeast Asia. Traces of a migration hidden for 1,500 years. Written, not in books but in the mitochondria of every child they bore. And here's the question that stops you cold, why women? Why does the East arrive through mothers, while fathers seem to tell a different story? Historians whisper theories. Marriage alliances sealed with river songs. Matriarchal customs carried on rafts of timber and salt. Perhaps these women came with merchants. Perhaps they came as brides, gifts of peace in an age of shattered empires. But what happened when they stepped onto Bengal's delta? When their tongues met a language they had never spoken? When their lullabies became the first bridge between two worlds? This wasn't conquest. This wasn't invasion. This was something quieter, something almost invisible, until science dragged it back from the grave. Because inside every Bengali mother, every grandmother, runs a faint river that once flowed from the east. A story that begins in bamboo villages and ends in a delta of endless green. But if women carried the east, who carried the west? Whose hands built kingdoms, carved mosques, and wrote Bengal's chronicles while this silent fusion unfolded in its villages? The answer hides in the men, and their blood tells a story just as explosive. Her story came from the east, but his, his footsteps came thundering from the west. Because when scientists dug into the Y chromosome, the father's line, they found a completely different signature. Not Burmese, not Tibeto Burman, but echoes of horsemen from the steppes, of merchants riding under Persian suns, of warriors kneeling on Turkic plains, Indo Aryan bloodlines. R1A, the same haplogroup carried by priests of the Vedas, by nomads who crossed mountains and carved their mark into India's north. And mingled with them, Turkic markers, whispers of the Silk Road. Men who rode with caravans heavy with silk and salt, who prayed under desert skies, and followed trade winds that bent history. Now, imagine that collision. A Bengali child born of a mother whose DNA drifts from bamboo forests and a father whose blood burns with the memory of step riders. What does identity even mean when your parents' genomes speak two different languages? Picture it. The delta alive with voices, women singing in dialects that roll like rivers, men chanting Persian prayers as the call to prayer blends with old folk songs, merchants setting up markets where saffron meets rice, where Persian glass clinks against lacquered Burmese wood. Not invasion, not assimilation, something more complicated. A dialogue between continents, between faiths, between the East and the West conducted in blood. And that dialogue didn't just write Bengal's history, it rewired its very biology. Every strand of DNA turned into a battlefield of adaptation, a crucible where survival decided who stayed and who vanished. Because this land was not gentle, it was a land of rivers that drowned cities, of diseases that could empty villages in a single season. Here, only the strongest bloodlines could endure. And Bengal? became a laboratory for life itself. But what forces demanded that price? What invisible enemies shaped this genetic symphony? The answer isn't in kings or wars, it's in a killer older than any empire. One that left no monuments, only graves, and a code carved into our blood. It wasn't swords that wrote the next chapter of Bengal's story. It wasn't kings or kingdoms. It was something smaller than the eye could see and it killed without mercy. Chalara, a ghost in the water, slipping through rivers, hiding in every gulp, every breath of humid air. It came with the monsoon floods. It came with the dry season thirst. And when it came, it emptied villages, entire families gone in days, children buried in fields where rice once grew. For centuries, Bengal was a graveyard carved by a single word, dehydration. But nature does something strange when faced with extinction. It rewrites the script, not in books, but in blood. And so, Bengal fought back not with armies, but with alleles. Generation after generation, the weak fell, and those who survived passed on something invisible. A code, a shield etched deep in their veins. 
Today, scientists call it selection. You call it life. And its signature is still there. Bengalis carry the world's lowest frequency of blood group O, the type that cholera loved to kill. Instead, their blood turned toward type B, a quiet rebellion against a disease older than any empire. Think about that. Your blood type may exist today because your ancestors lived through a war with water, because bodies became battlegrounds, and evolution chose its winners in silence. But the river wasn't done shaping Bengal, because in those same swamps where cholera lurked, another enemy waited. Not in water this time, but in wings. Buzzing in the humid dark, carrying a fever that could turn night into fire. Malaria. And the price of surviving that killer? It was written in yet another mutation, a twist of DNA that would save lives for centuries and curse others in return. The rivers gave life, but they also gave birth to something darker. The same waters that fed Bengal's fields became a breeding ground for wings thin, fragile, deadly. Mosquitoes. And with them came the fever. Not a quick death like cholera this one lingered. It burned through nights, stole breath from lungs, and left bodies trembling under wet sheets. Malaria. For centuries, this fever ruled the delta. It didn't care for kings, for caste, for prayers. It struck rich and poor alike, leaving the same silence in their homes. And the people of Bengal had to find a way to survive. Nature answered, as it always does, not with mercy, but with math. It rewrote a line in the blood, a tiny twist in a single gene, what scientists now call hemoglobin E, a mutation that turned red blood cells into a weapon, making it harder for the parasite to thrive. Those who carried it lived. Those who didn't vanished from the story. But there was a price, because this bargain came with a curse. When two carriers married, their child inherited the mutation twice, and what once saved a life became a sentence. Today, doctors call it E, beta thalassemia. Children born with it fight a war their ancestors never imagined. Think about that for a moment. A mutation that saved villages for centuries, now kills in modern hospitals. Every drop of blood carrying the memory of an ancient enemy and the cost of winning that fight. And if you listen closely, you can still hear it in culture. Old folk songs, rituals under fevered skies, Charms tied to mosquito nets, echoes of a genetic war fought in silence. But this battle didn't just shape bodies. It shaped identity. Because survival in Bengal was never just about blood, it was about mixing, adapting, blending cultures as easily as genes. And that left a mark that you can still taste, still hear, still speak. Because language itself holds the next secret. And inside every word, is another map of migrations no one ever told you about. Language is supposed to be honest. It should tell you who you are, where you come from. But listen closely to Bengali, and it starts whispering secrets no one taught you in school. Because hidden between its vowels and verbs are sounds that don't belong. Words that feel like strangers soft, breathy, sliding in like shadows from another world. They are not Sanskrit, not Indo-Aryan. They come from the east, from tongues once spoken under bamboo roofs in valleys far from the Ganges plains. Folk songs still hum those notes. Songs that rise like smoke from riverbanks, curling with melodies that trace back to Austroasiatic hills and Tibeto Burman trails. Even the food tells the story steam rising from banana leaves, flavors sharpened with fermented fish, recipes that drifted from mountain streams to Bengal's muddy deltas. Every plate, Every lullaby, every whispered phrase, is a fossil. Proof that identity is never pure, it is a river, carrying what it touches, leaving traces where it flows. But here's the question that unsettles, everything was this blending an accident? Just neighbors trading words like they traded salt and rice? Or was Bengal something more? Something bigger than we ever imagined? Because the further you look, the stranger the pattern becomes. These borrowed words, these drifting customs, they don't speak of isolation. They speak of movement, of traffic, 
of a crossroad so alive, so central, that language is bent to its gravity. And that forces us to ask, what kind of place was Bengal a thousand years ago? A quiet delta cut off by rivers? Or the beating heart of a world-spanning web, where boats carried not just goods but ideas, bloodlines, entire cultures? Because if DNA tells us who we are, language tells us what we remembered. And every Bengali syllable remembers a time when Bengal was not just a region, it was a hub, a center of exchange older than the Silk Road. And if that's true, then the next clue won't be in words. It will be in maps. Maps that reveal a maritime empire so vast, it rewrote the story of the Indian Ocean. The next secret isn't buried in words. It's drawn on water. Look at a map. That blue triangle where the Ganges kisses the sea looks quiet today. But a thousand years ago, it was the busiest corridor on earth. The Bay of Bengal. Not a bay at all, but a highway. A liquid silk road. Here, ships didn't just carry goods, they carried worlds. Arab dows heavy with incense and dates. Chinese junk stacked with porcelain and silk. Burmese rafts gliding with timber, spices, and salt. All of them meeting in Bengal, a delta so rich it pulled traders like gravity. And along with cargo, they carried something more enduring than spice or silk. They carried blood. Every handshake, every marriage sealed on a monsoon night, left its trace. And today, that trace is still inside you. Because DNA is a ledger. Every gene is an entry in a book written by merchants, sailors, and strangers who never dreamed of you. A record of a shipping empire that stretched from Arabia to Thailand, from Sri Lanka to Sumatra. Long before anyone spoke of globalization, this sea had already done it. It connected east and west, not with armies, but with tides. Think of that for a moment. Your family tree doesn't rise from soil, it floats on salt water. Your identity was built on waves stitched together by sails, carved by winds that blew across the Indian Ocean for centuries. And yet, here's the strangest part. For all the stories we've uncovered, for all the clues etched in language, in bones, in blood, there is still something missing. Something so vast, so ancient, it haunts every scientist who touches this puzzle. Because if Bengal was the center of a world-spanning network, what else is hiding beneath its rivers, its ruins, its forgotten ports? What truth still sleeps under layers of mud and myth? The answer may not even be on land. It may be under the sea. And it could change everything we think we know about the origins of South Asia. We followed the clues through rivers and ruins, through lullabies and bloodlines. And yet the picture still refuses to stay still. Because Bengalis are South Asian. Every history book says so. But their DNA? It bends that truth like a reed in the wind. It speaks two languages, one from the West, the call of the Vedas, the echo of Indo-Aryan tongues, and another from the East, whispers that drifted from bamboo groves across misted hills into the heart of the Ganges Delta. That is the contradiction carved into every chromosome. Identity is not a wall, it's a river. It twists, it braids, it carries what it touches, leaving traces in every drop. So, what does that mean for us? If a people who look so rooted, so certain of their place, turn out to be a living bridge between worlds, what does that make the rest of us? Because if DNA can reveal forgotten highways of migration roads that maps never marked, journeys no historian wrote, then what else is hiding under our skin? What other secrets, what lost empires, what erased kingdoms are sleeping inside us, waiting for a scientist to wake them? And maybe, just maybe, the biggest secret isn't in the deserts or the mountains. Maybe it's underwater, under the mud-choked ports of Bengal, under the drowned cities swallowed by the bay, where tides keep the silence of an age before history began. Could the real story of South Asia's origins still be sleeping beneath those waves? And if that story rises, will it rewrite everything we know about who we are? If you love untold histories, if you crave mysteries older than time itself, stay with us. Subscribe now, because the next reveal might change the way you see your own blood.